We are now, uh, today we are finishing Romans 15. Uh, we only have three weeks left in Romans. This is one of those three. We're looking at verses 22 through 33 in Romans chapter 15. So will you stand for the reading of God's word? You can follow along on the screen or in your Bible. I'm reading from the English Standard Version. The word of the Lord. This is the reason why I have so often been hindered from coming to you. But now, since I no longer have any room for work in these regions, and since I have longed for many years to come to you, I hope to see you in passing as I go to Spain, and to be helped on my journey there by you, once I have enjoyed your company for a while. At present, however, I am going to Jerusalem, bringing aid to the saints, for Macedonia and Arcilla have been pleased to, to make some contribution to the poor among the saints of Jerusalem. For they were pleased to do it, and indeed they owe it to them. For if the Gentiles have come to share in their spiritual blessings, they ought to, have, have, they ought to also be of service to them in material blessings. When therefore I have completed this and have delivered to them what was collected... I will leave for Spain by way of you. I know that when I come to you, I will come in the fullness of the blessing of Christ. I appeal to you, brothers, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit to strive together with me in your prayers to God on my behalf, that I may be delivered from the unbelievers in Judea and that my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints, so that by God's will I may come to you with joy and be refreshed in your company. May the God of peace be with you all. Amen. Word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So as we know, chapter 15, Paul is finishing up his letter with these closing remarks. And we're reminded that Paul is writing this letter again to a church he had never been to. He's writing from Corinth, which is really just across the Aegean Sea there in the Mediterranean from Rome. But he's writing from Corinth to this church he'd never met, and he wants them to know his reasons for why he hasn't visited them sooner. And of course, his reasons are, as we talked a little bit about this last week, first his mission work that he has felt a very strong call from the Lord to go and bring the gospel to these places that don't already have an established church. Rome was actually most likely one of the early established churches because it's believed that some believers during Pentecost must have taken the message back to Rome. That wasn't Paul's effort. That was the Holy Spirit's effort from Pentecost. And Paul realized that he was trying to go in unbroken territory, un unreached lands before he reached them. But he wanted to go there. The other reason why he hasn't come to Rome sooner is he has a very real call on his life to collect funds for the church in Jerusalem. Now, we're not sure exactly, but we know that, of course, in Acts, we see that the church starts in Jerusalem, and you see the church ex ex exploding and expanding into the thousands, and people meeting in homes in the temple. But something I have pointed out before in the time of Acts is there was kind of this immediacy that took place in Jerusalem that caused them to, to, to live in what, was, what would be understood today as more like a commune kind of situation. Not, it wasn't communistic. They weren't like talking economics or reading Karl Marx. But they were saying, okay, their, their understanding was Jesus uh, said he's going to come back. Our assumption is he's coming back pretty quick. So we've got this urgent reality to get to the nations and to, and to respond to the people. But what happened was is that everyone kind of stopped working and they worshiped together and they made their focus on being together and making the kingdom ready so that uh, they'd be ready for when Jesus returned. We see later in some of Corinthians and some of Paul's writings, he's speaking back to this church about and churches like them, about what it means to, okay, you need to still live in the world and continue the mission and just be ready for whenever Christ does decide to come back. But what happened is, because of that commune-style living, it probably brought them to some level of poverty. 
Not only that, but some scholars would point out that when the Jews, many of these people that were converting were Jewish, and when they would convert, they were, were seen as black sheep, and they were removed from their, they were, they were seen as black sheep in their families, but they also might have lost their jobs. They might have lost the jobs that they had as Jewish folk in Jerusalem. So there's a variety of reasons, but Jerusalem has fallen on hard times. And Paul, as we saw last time, he saw spiritually that he's bringing the Gentiles in as a sacrifice to God, in a sense. He, he, he's bringing the gospel to them because the gospel is now going to the nations, not just the Jews. But also he sees a real harvest and a real offering being brought to God through the material blessing of the Gentiles on behalf of of the impoverished Jews. And so in this world, the Gentiles, the Greeks, the Romans, they were more wealthy because the society was built for them in a sense and they had access to different things and the Jews were on hard times. They were the they were seen as more second class. But remember Rome and Jew, the tension was building and building and building and it was going to explode in 70 AD. It was only getting worse, especially if you weren't living in the Jewish ways and you were a Christian, you were even you were third class. And so, what, so Paul sees that the Gentiles are receiving the gospel that came to the Jews. Well, then it's only fair that the Gentiles recognize their, their brothers, the people of God, and bring them some kind of material blessing. So he really sees that as important for him, and he's bringing that back. I always think of that, the, the poem, when I think of Paul here, promises to keep. He's right in the room. I got promises to keep and miles to go before I sleep. Let's look at the map here. To help us understand, because there's, there's some question of, okay, Paul, why, why have you not come to us? You're writing to us from Corinth, if you see that red arrow there. Why don't you just plop on over and come visit us in Rome? What's taking you so long? He's much closer to Rome in some ways than he is to getting back to Jerusalem. Why not come to Rome and then go back? And Paul's giving us some of that example. You see here all the different arrows are Paul's missionary journeys. And he speaks of these areas of Macedonia and Asia Minor, Turkey, that he has done a lot of his work. But he's hoping to go over to Rome and use Rome as a launching point to go to Spain and even probably send missionaries out of Rome. We see in Acts that he does make that journey, and that's the purple line. And that's his final missionary journey that we have recorded in Acts. So Paul says, essentially right out of the the gate in verse 23, I have longed for many years to come to you. So there's a real desire in Paul to visit these saints in Rome. Like I said, he's given his reasons why he hasn't been able to come there, but he wants to be with them. But he says his, his plans, his personal desires have been put on the back burner, have been hindered because of other responsibilities that he has. And we know from Acts, these are God-given responsibilities. These are God-given calls that he has. God has not allowed him yet to visit Rome, even though his heart would love to. He even mentions twice about how he wants to enjoy their company, be refreshed by them. This tension here in these verses in Paul's heart is valuable to us as Christians and how we live in our ministry. And I think there's some principles we can draw to it. One is this. As believers, our missionary task is never complete until the return of Christ. As believers, our missionary task is never complete until the return of Christ or until you pass into glory. Hear me well, church. Retirement is not an option for us. For as long as we have breath in our lungs, there is still work to be done as believers. Now, I'm not talking about, you know, retirement in terms of being a pipe fitter or working at a corporate or in, in terms of your job, but as, a, as being a believer, the job description of being a believer and we've been talking about this over again, about what it means to be a disciple, is that each and every one of you have a missionary call on your heart. It's not just Pastor Luke that does the missionary or the missionaries we support. You too are a missionary. You are called to be in the world, but not of the world, to go into wherever you are and be a light for Christ and to proclaim his gospel and to show his love. Doesn't mean you have to, and you don't have to go to Saudi Arabia or Africa or Saskatchewan, or Oswatomie, Kansas. 
to be a missionary, you be a missionary right here in your backyard. And that's what we say, you know, part of our, our initial call is to be a church to our community. And among many of some of you, God may call you to foreign lands. He may call you hundreds of miles away. He might call you to Cleveland, Ohio. Ooh, right? Sorry. You have a missionary call in your life, and you do not, you're not, you're, you're never called, to, you don't retire from that. No one retires from that. Not even pastors retire from that. They may, they may retire from their, this level of job, but do not retire as a Christian or a missionary or a preacher of the word. I hope that I can preach until I pass out in my spaghetti. I really do. There's still work to be done. The sharing of the gospel, encouraging the church, providing support, training disciples. These are ongoing responsibilities that we have. And Paul understood that for his life. And it, 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 it kept him from doing what he maybe wanted to do. But he knew he had a call in his life. We are all in this together. And we must keep passing the baton until our last breath. As John 9, 4, Jesus says, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. So let us continue our work while it is day. As Paul is saying to you, I haven't gotten to you because I've been working. Amen? Let's be a working people. We're not called to say, you know, I've done, I've done my time. I've done, I've done my work. I've done, you know, I've done enough for the church Whatever it may be, no, that, that, that cannot be. And maybe we've, done, we've been doing things and trying to earn. We, I'm not talking about do stuff to earn your salvation or do stuff to make you feel good or do stuff because you're guilty. No, I'm not talking about, I'm talking about the overflow, the outpouring of your love for God that continues. That no matter where I go, I'm not, well, I used to be an evangelist, but I gave that up. No, it's no matter where you go, the barbershop, the store, uh, <laughs> name it. That you're on mission. You have a missionary mindset. When you serve in the church, that you're on mission. You know, it's this kind of reality that brought the church to where it is today. The 1700s historian Edward Gibbons wrote an interesting book called The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. And it explains the rapid expansion of Christianity in the first century of that Roman Empire. Tertullian, one of the early church fathers who wrote around 200 A.D., just um, only you know, into, the, into the second century, he said this about the church, We are but of yesterday, and we have filled every place among you, cities, islands, fortresses, towns, marketplaces, the very camp, tribes, companies, palace, senate, forum. We have left nothing to you but the temples of your gods. How did that occur? How did Christianity permeate, saturate the Roman Empire in this way? Well, Gibbon suggests that it was because in the early church, he says, it became the most sacred duty of a new convert to diffuse among his friends and relations the inestimable ble- the in- estimable blessing which he had received. In other words, each believer considered themselves to be a missionary. And it did not mean that you had to be a pastor or a missionary with a title, but that you are, that everywhere you go, no matter where you work and wherever, where you be, you are a missionary. That's how the kingdom grows. And if any of those prior generations retired on that call, you would not be here. Amen? Thank the Lord for those that have gone before us, that have passed the baton faithfully until their dying breath. Adolf Harnack, the German church historian, says, the most numerous and successful missionaries of the Christian religion were not the regular teachers, but Christians themselves in virtue of their loyalty and courage. It was characteristic of this religion that everyone who seriously confessed to faith provided of service to its propaganda. We cannot hesitate to believe that the great mission of Christianity was in reality accomplished 
by means of informal missionaries. Informal missionaries. So number one we learn from this is Paul understands that believers, our missionary task is never complete. And because of that, too, God doesn't always send us where we want to go. God doesn't always send us where we want to go or how we want it to go. Can I get an amen? amen. You know, as I was in Colorado this week, and I looked at the mountains, not Denver, but the mountains, I thought to myself, man, that view beats Gladstone. <laughs> Maybe some of you would disagree. And I, lo- I love Gladstone. You know, you look at you, maybe you, it's a beach for you or some wood or some national park. And there's always a part of us that's like, man, if I could just live on a little shack overlooking this, these, these mountains, right? Maybe I should be a, the monk of the Rockies. But no, that's not my call. You know, that was, that maybe Jonah thought, you know, Nineveh doesn't look too great. And I'm not comparing Gladstone to Nineveh. <laughs> but you know, Nineveh doesn't look so great. I don't think I'll go there. In fact, I'll probably die. And he ran from God's call. Regularly, God does not always send us where we may want to go. But he calls us. He calls us to places. He calls us to fertilize the ground we've been given. Amen? He calls us to be a light place we've been and of course in that you find that the place that you've been called to ain't that bad and it's got a lot of good amen but Paul desired to go to Rome you probably heard about Rome they had a they had a Barnes and Noble coffee shop in their church or something and they had you know a rock climb for the kids my analogies they break down I don't know. but he had responsibilities elsewhere that he knew were from God Because God's itinerary is not our itinerary. You've heard me say this a million times. We always want God to get on with our plans. We say, you know, God, I'd like to do this, and I'd like for you to bless it, please. Right? That's how we tend to live our lives instead of the other way around. God, get me on your itinerary. Get me with your plans. Align me to your will. His ways are not our ways. He tells us this over and over again. His timing is not our timing. Robert Howdeen, the great Scottish pastor of the age generous, said, although the task remains unchanged, God often accomplishes its fulfillment in ways we do not anticipate or desire. Thank the Lord. Jesus actually told this to Peter after restoring him. After he said, Peter, you're going to deny me three times. Peter said, you're wrong. Not going to happen. It happened. But Jesus restored him. He said, Peter, you know, and I, I could, you could see Jesus kind of talking to the disciples as they were still confused and, and their, their notions about the Messiah, and he's taking him out to the garden. And you just have this, this is not going to go the way you think it's going to go. It's going to be better than you think. But it's not the means of way you're thinking about it is not how it's going to go. You know, the whole, I will fight for you, I will die for you. This isn't going to go how you think. In fact, you're, the main enemy here, Peter, is not, it's not Rome. It's you. It's what's in here. And you're going to even deny me. up this, you, you, you need me more than you could possibly imagine, Peter. Get behind me. Follow me. Right? Very truly, I tell you, Peter, when you were younger, you dressed yourself. You went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands, and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to him to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, in spite of that, Peter, follow me. Paul twice states in this passage that he longs to enjoy their company. He wants to be in fellowship with these brothers and sisters. He wants to be refreshed by them. But we see by Acts 24 and 28... He, you know, Paul says, I hope to come to you in the full blessing of Christ. He didn't know what he was saying, or maybe he did. What did the full blessing of Christ mean for Paul? How did he come to these people? Well, evidently, 
the full blessing of Christ included a hazardous journey, being shipwrecked, almost dying from snake, bite, arriving bound in chains as a prisoner, and facing the prospect of death. As Robert Burns, the great Scottish poet, put it, the best laid plans of mice and men gang off ugly, go often wrong. The best laid plans of mice and men frequently fail. We know people. I saw many this week at GA who plan to go to the far reaches of places like Japan that has been attempted to break into for decades, centuries. Russia, Indonesia, and China, but have not been able to get there yet. Hasn't gone the way they thought it would go. So God doesn't always send us where we want to go or how we want to go. And there, but, but, three, it's okay to plan and set goals, but be ready to pivot. Be ready for the unexpected. So at the same time, we see Paul here saying, I hope to get to you, but I've got these things to do first. And they didn't go exactly, he did get to them, but they didn't go exactly the way he wanted. But Paul doesn't have this anxious fatalism that it will be what it will be necessarily. He still moves forward with the information that he has. And I think that this is the missionary mindset that we are called to have. It's a faithful mindset that God is good, that his promises are true. I may not have all the details. I'm not in control of the itinerary. But I trust the God who does have the details and who is control of the itinerary. And I will be ready that when my plans get disrupted, interrupted, it means something. It's not meaningless. This is the missionary mindset. Even though Paul had been hindered and delayed time and time again, it didn't change the fact that Paul wanted in his heart to come. It was okay. It was right to, be amongst, to want to be amongst believers, to see them. He prayed to come. He asked them to pray that it would go this way. And he planned to come. As I said, Paul didn't stop moving and become paralyzed in fatalism. Or destiny. Paul's plan was to go to Spain. He believed this was God's will for him. We don't know if he got to Spain or not. There's some evidence that he did, and there's some evidence that he didn't. Someone got to Spain. Amen? James 4 says, Now listen, you who say, Today or tomorrow, we will go to, to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. Why you do not even know what will happen tomorrow? What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. We have to be flexible as missionaries. God frequently accomplishes what we rightly desire for him in ways we could not have imagined. So the desire may be right, but the means may be very different. Jamie taught me a wonderful statement. I believe it was from the Beatitudes. Blessed are the flexible, for they shall not break. Amen? It's not from the Beatitudes, just for... Who would have thought that God's way of making the Jewish people into a great nation would have been going through years, 400 years of slavery? Who would have thought that the Lord's salvation of you and I would be through the scandal of a Roman cross? Therefore, be prepared for new things and unexpected circumstances. We've said... In the Gospels, it's almost annoying how often Jesus is interrupted by someone. He's on his way to do something, and something happens. 
He's walking, and Jesus was walking, so, and someone grabbed him. Someone said something to him. Someone called out to him, constantly interrupting him. And rarely does Jesus go, you fools, leave me alone, and ran away. He responds. He engages. He pivots. He doesn't change who he is, but he responds to it. And we live out a life of interruptions. We have to be a people that are willing to be interrupted. Because if we don't, we're still saying this. And I do, you know, I, I forget this regularly. Jamie says, I need you to pick something up at the store. And I, I pull in, and man, I am like, it is in aisle B, section C, and I'm going to get there. And, and, you know, I, I've learned to love that self-checkout because I'm like, you know, just, dum, 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 you know, I don't, and I don't have to, if I don't want to, I don't got to talk to anybody, look at anybody, I can just get it done. My itinerary, my time. Right? And that's how we go through life. Show me the self-checkout. Come on, right? Show me the self-checkout. Show me the mission. Blinders on. But that's not how life works. Is it? And if we live our life that way, that's why, so, that's why road rage is so all off the hook all the time. Because everybody's living in their, man, man does it bring out sin. If you, wanna, if you don't believe in original sin, right, drive more on the highway during rush hour. It's in there because we don't want to be interrupted. We have a plan. We think we're going to get, when, I, when I'm going to get there at this time, I'm going to get there at that time. And everybody else revolves around me and my time. And if anyone interrupts me, stands in my way, bother, bothers me at the store, buy gum, you're, you're, in, you're injecting yourself into my reality and my world. Self-absorbed, self-checkout. I'm not against the self-checkout. Some, yeah, but uh, you get But we got to be prepared to be interrupted. Not just by people, but by God. God's going to interrupt you. Thank God for his interruptions. Every time God interrupts you, it is a good thing, beloved. Receive it. Do not, do not, and yeah, it may annoy you at first because you don't, because you're sinful and you don't get it, but be ready for it. And you know, the number one way to respond to an interrupted life is to know it's going to happen. To prepare your heart and your mind to know this is how God works because I am self-absorbed. And if, he, if, if had not God interrupted me in interrupting me, I would never look up. And often it was God's interruptions in our life that lead to the biggest blessings. Although the task of taking the gospel to the, last, the lost remains unchanged, the ends remains unchanged, God will probably accomplish your part in ways you do not anticipate. Thank the Lord. For anybody in this room that said, oh, please, Lord, I wish that I could get married this year and that it would be like so-and-so, thank the Lord it didn't, right? Thank the Lord that the person you thought you were going to marry or be with didn't work out and that you're with, you know, or, the, or thank the Lord that the place you thought you were going to live or the job that you thought you were going to have didn't work out. Thank God that things didn't go your way, how different they would be. Thank God for that. You know, I think of, I think of Nathan Edwards, who is a pastor um, that we support and is a church planner in the EPC, and he's preached here a couple of times. And we're supporting his church called Renew KC. It's a brand new EPC church plant in Lee Summit. Well, he has a fantastic story that I think illustrates this point. He was a pastor down in Baton Rouge for a couple of years. And he really got chewed up and spit out of that church. It was not the right fit for him. It went poorly. I don't know all the details. But he basically left that church and came back to his hometown of Kansas City heartbroken. It didn't work out. It was his first call to the pastorate. And the, the, the church rejected him, essentially. Only for just a few years. And he ended up back in Lee Summit. And his wife... Uh, is a doctor, and so it allowed to give us some time to contemplate. I uh, said, so, okay, Lord, what are you calling me to do? Am I even supposed to be in the ministry? Why am I here? Why am I back where I started? Why am I back in Lee Summit? And he eventually started to feel this tug and call that he needed to just start by reaching out to his neighbors. 
and he started to reach out to his neighbors, and he, had, and he started to have these bonfires in his backyard and these kind of just s'more hot dog get-togethers, and he started to really get to know his next-door neighbor and their family. And then he started to talk to Colonial about, you know, maybe I'm called to doing a church plant. And it, one thing kind of led to another, but they weren't quite sure yet, and he was feeling really defeated and not sure why he was in Lee Summit. He thought he was called to Baton Rouge. What happened, God? And one day he's having one of those get-togethers around the fire, and his neighbor, in his 40s, I think, is just sitting there eating a hot dog and then passes out dead. Right there. Right in front of him and his kids, his own kids, around at this, this little get to the neighbor, this little get together. Remember what I told you? Nathan's wife is a doctor. And not only is she a doctor, but a cardiac deals with this thing every day. And she immediately starts life-saving procedures on him and saves his life. And the EMT said if someone hadn't started this, he had a massive heart attack. If someone hadn't done this immediately, he would certainly be dead. Right there in front of his kids, family, just was dead, was really, was, un, was, was dead before he hit the ground and was brought back to life by Nathan's wife. And Nathan will tell you, with tears in his eyes, and his wife will tell you, that that's when they knew that they were called to Lee Summit for a purpose, to save that man's life. But not only that, that reassured them that they were called to start a church in Lee Summit among their neighbors. They didn't know why they were where they were. They didn't want to be where they were. They didn't want to be back in Lee Summit. But God brought them there for a purpose. And he made that purpose clear, and God will make that purpose clear in time. But you've got to be ready to pivot. Okay, God, you want us here. That's clear. That's a missionary mindset. Got to be flexible. So finishing up, when God closes doors in your life, be prepared for him to open other doors. Sometimes he may have you sit before the closed door for a couple years or months or weeks. Sometimes you need to sit in front of a closed door. But God will open a door. He has a plan if you're willing to submit. If you are serving God and your work is not done, perhaps he has not released you from your work, then keep at it. Don't get restless. Don't long for the mountains when God has called you to where you are. Whatever your mountain is, we all have something that God's, that you would like, that maybe would feel better for you, but has God called you there? Has he released you? Is that clear? Don't get restless. Keep working. If one opportunity, though, is closed, and that's usually clear, <laughs> Perhaps the people in your Bible study have moved away and you're no longer serving in the Sunday school or you're no longer on that church board. Pray and look for something else. Be ready. Be ready for God to work. The needs are great all around us and the opportunities endless. Trust and know that wherever you end up, as Paul prayed, that the God of peace will go with you. And I finish with this, this last illustration of David Livingston. Anybody know about David Livingston? great missionary to Africa, great explorer. He goes down in history, not just as a missionary to Africa, but one of the greatest explorers of Africa in the English nation, one of the great doctors, Dr. Livingston. Yes. I encourage you to read and look about David Livingston. 1800s, Scottish missionary and doctor to Africa. He's a prime example of a missionary mindset. David Livingston went to the London Missionary Society and told them that he liked to go to Africa. And most people did not go to Africa long because it was, in Africa there was disease that killed a lot of white people, like David Livingston, uh, the mosquitoes, the, 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 the forest and the jungles. It was a very tough country to break into. And so you went other places. But David Livingston said, I'm going to go there. I'm going to go there as a doctor missionary. And they asked him, first, where do you want to go? It was actually before, I think, he even had the idea of Africa. He said, anywhere, as long as it is forward. God, send me anywhere, only go with me. Lay any burden on me, only you sustain me. 
and sever any tie in my heart except the tie that binds my heart to yours. I'd rather be in the heart of Africa, in the will of God, than on the throne of England, out of will, out of the will of God. Without Christ, not one step. With him, anywhere. And after serving decades of tough, life-threatening ministry in the wilds of Africa, which he still remembered today in many parts, David was asked to give a lecture to mission students at the University of Cambridge in England. And he said, shall I tell you what supports me? What supported me through all those years of exile among a people whose language I could not understand and whose attitude towards me always uncertain and often hostile? It was this. Lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the age. And so we can stand victorious like Paul is, is doing. I know God's calling me forward. I know his kingdom is advancing. I know God's going to get it done. So Lord, whatever it is, wherever it is, go with me. Be with me. I am yours. And so that, that goes back to that Romans 12, 1 posture. Offer your body as a living sacrifice to him. Not on your timetable, not in your itinerary, but to God's who is good and worthy of your trust. So let us say together, go with me, abide with me, sustain me. Let's pray.